Margaret Pole, the Countess of Salisbury. One of the most brutal executions associated with the dark history of the Tower of London is that of Margaret Pole, the Countess of Salisbury. She suffered a torturous imprisonment that followed by a bludgeoned execution. Please continue to support my channel by subscribing. Margaret Pole was a high-ranking noble lady in society. She was the daughter of George Fantagna, the Duke of Clarence, and her mother was Isabella Neville. She was the niece of King Edward IV and Richard III. After the War of Roses, Margaret was one of the only few surviving members of the Plantagenets. Her presence was deemed important and her influence in Tudor society was pivotal. Her early life was played with drama and death. Her maternal grandfather was killed while fighting against her uncle, Edward IV, at the Barnet Battle. Her mother, the great heiress Isabel Neville, died in 1476, after giving birth to her fourth child. Her father, George, had two servants executed as he believed that they had poisoned her and Margaret was perhaps too young to remember her mother, and it is likely that she was brought up within her father's princely household. When her father was later killed for treason, she would have lived with her cousins, the many daughters of Edward IV. And after Richard III seized the throne, Margaret was sent to Yorkshire with her brother. The two children could be used as pawns, as their mother's family, the Nevilles, had gained allegiance in the north. It was after Richard was killed that Margaret was able to come to court under the new regime. In September 1486, she attended the christening of Arthur, the first Tudor prince, who she would later go on to become his future wife, Catherine of Aragon's lady-in-waiting. Richard died and he left behind his wife and five children. She was left a widow with no income and little future prospects so she was forced to live in an abbey with nuns to survive. She would return to favour of the court when Henry VIII ascended to the throne. He went on to marry his brother's wife, the Catherine of Aragon, and Margaret would again become one of her ladies-in-waiting. Parliament did restore some of her brother's land to her, and she became the Countess of Salisbury. She managed these lands well, and things were beginning to look promising she gained respect in her favourite court alongside her sons who were also becoming important members of the court. She was appointed the governess of Henry VIII's daughter Mary, the future Bloody Mary. Her relationship with her flourished and Margaret defended Mary when she was declared a bastard following Henry VIII's new marriage to Anne Boleyn. Not only did Margaret defend Henry's daughter against the king, but her son also spoke out publicly about his poor treatment of the Catherine of Aragon. This drama would lead to a fallout in the court, and she would refuse to give Mary's jewels back to the king. The king therefore labelled her a fool with no experience once Mary's household broke up. Reginald Pole, Margaret's son, at the age of only seven, he had given himself fully to God, and so he never married. As he grew older, he rose through the church's ranks during the reign of Henry VIII. He began to rebel against the current monarchy and he published statements denouncing Henry VIII's policies. This was a dangerous deed and the king was insulted and humiliated and so he wanted to get revenge on the Pole family in retaliation to his bruised ego. Margaret Pole and her sons still had the Plantagenet blood, and so their existence alongside the repeated rebellions were interpreted as a viable threat to Henry's throne. Reginald Pole became a cardinal, and the Pope placed him in charge of organising parts of the Pilgrimage of Grace. The Pilgrimage of Grace was one of the most serious Tudor rebellions against Henry and it led to the Catholic Church breaking away and later the termination of the monasteries. Their destruction came with a series of arrests in the autumn of 1538. Margaret's youngest son, Geoffrey, probably under threat of torture, denounced his own family. 
After his interrogation, he made a botched suicide attempt, and Margaret was arrested. The accusations of treason against Margaret would lead to her losing her titles and land. To cement her fate of death, Cromwell produced a piece of evidence against Margaret that would multiply suspicions of her guilt. He produced a tunic that bore the five wounds of Christ, which linked her support of Catholicism. The tunic was only found six months after her house had already been searched, so it is evident that this was planted there to ensure that she would be sentenced to death. But first, she would be imprisoned for two and a half years at the Tower of London. Throughout her imprisonment, she was treated reasonably well. She had servants who would attend to her needs, as well as being granted an extensive collection of clothing inside the walls of her cell. A poem was found carved on the wall of her cell, and it read, For traitors on the block should die. I am no traitor, no, not I. My faithfulness stands fast and so. Towards the block I shall not go. Nor make one step, as you shall see. Christ in thy mercy, save thou me. Henry the Eighth was hell-bent on his revenge, and he wished to rid the realm of those that went against him, and those that threatened his throne. His merciless quest included the frail 67-year-old lady, Margaret Pole. Margaret Pole was informed on the morning of the 27th of May, 1541, that she was to die within the hour. She pleaded her innocence and that she had committed no crime. Despite her pleas, she was taken from her cell to the wooden block within the Tower of London. She was not executed on a scaffold in public due to her nobility, as this would cause public humiliation. She was executed in private instead, but this did not make her execution any prettier. Two written reports of her execution survived, and each one tells a slightly different account of her extremely merciless and brutal death. The first account explains that Margaret went to the block unaware of her crimes she had been accused of, and that she had been sentenced to death. The main executioner had been sent north to deal with the rebels, so he left her execution with an inexperienced person. The first account describes how the inexperienced youth hacked her head and shoulders to pieces in the most pitiful manner and how he took multiple swings of the axe to sever her head from her body before he could kill her. The second account describes that after the inexperienced youth took his first swing at her body that she escaped from the block and ran away. You can imagine the pain that she would have experienced after even just the first blow to her shoulders. She was then caught and the youth tried again to swing his axe towards her head, but he failed multiple times before he finally beheaded her. Both accounts tell a grim tale of the end of the frail 67-year-old woman's life. She was buried inside the Tower of London, in the chapel of St. Peter, at Vicula. She had been accused of a crime that she pleaded repeatedly, until the very end, that she had never committed. She then spent the last few years of her life in prison within the Tower of London, before meeting her painful and twisted end. Her execution is one of the most bloody in the Tower's history due to the executioner of choice being so inexperienced, and the controversy over her death is because she may have never plotted against the king, and the evidence against her Catholic support was likely planted. She died a traitor under the law, but to many others she was judged wrongly. She was merely an elderly woman who did not deserve such a barbaric end. 345 years after her death in 1886, Lady Salisbury became a martyr in the eyes of the Catholic Church. Please comment, like and subscribe if you wish for more stories and leave your suggestions below and I will endeavour to cover them.